Oh, there we go. Hello. Hi, Gary. Mm. Hi, Tim. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm all right. All right. It's uh, a real pleasure to meet you, uh, eventually. Oh, well, you as well. Uh, I've enjoyed your books over the years. Well, I think we share a um, uh, passion for, what would you call it, the esoteric traditions, perhaps, is, a, is as good a way in as any. Yes. And I, I actually heard, I can't even remember what it was now, but it was a particular interview you gave or something. And I remember being struck by um, how you, what you were thinking. And it made me feel like I really enjoy connecting with you and just uh, finding out a little bit more about what you've been exploring all these years. Well, I, wish you, I wish you could remember which interview it was so I, I could remember I, what I said. I wish I could too, but it was a long time ago now. Um, but I, um, that, that's what initiated me first getting in contact yeah. with you. Um, but uh, if... Um, if you'll indulge me, what I, what I, I, this, this kind of series started some time ago now, um, really because I find myself probably every day actually, um, looking around me and thinking, what the hell is this that I'm in that's happening? What, what is this thing that's happening? right now I mean, just just life in general or the particular yeah, you know version of it. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Oh, there you go yes yes I know um, what you mean. and uh, and uh, and so i i kind of felt like i'd like to talk with people that i find interesting and have been exploring things and just start a conversation with that you know like you've been doing this like me for sounds like quite a few decades hmm. what do you, what do you think it is we're experiencing and, well, and, I, I, I have less an idea of it now um, than I did when I was much younger. I thought I had more of a grasp on it and where it was all going, myself in particular. Uh, but now, uh, I don't know. I do find myself at times thinking, you know, maybe this is a simulation. <laughs> I don't know. I do sometimes thinking, uh, find myself thinking, um, you know, perhaps we might take more literally the, these notions of... Um, some other world or, or some something like that the notion the gnostic notion of the being false world or something like that and uh no it's 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 just it's just the sheer well i'll say the other day i was thinking it came to me you can, we can't apply the notion of probability to existence sorry i'm, I'm going a little abstract here no because, no say that again you said we can or we can't that we cannot we can't apply the notion of the universe existence is neither probable nor improbable because any ideas we have of probability come from existence itself. Gotcha. So we're accepting the very thing that we're we're questioning the probability of. So we you know we can't we can't do that. I mean, so uh, even the idea, like you know, because it does strike me as like of all the strangest strangest things that could possibly happen would be to some some immense you know complex world uh, that we find ourselves in. And we have no idea. No one has any idea. There's been some good guesses or good stories about it down the line that have served purpose o over time at different times. There's been some some rather bad ones too, uh, some stories. But I guess that's that's the sort of thing. It's like the, the story or the narrative, which is sort of the word everyone uses these days. Um, sounds a bit more intellectual or something. Um, <laughs> the narrative rather than the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, science so, has made you know, it up. And, and I guess that, in one sense, that's it's kind of the postmodern condition. And I guess we're post post everything at this point. But you know, all the grand narratives no longer hold up. But you know, just just in that sense, just like you say, you know, you you if. You, we can take existence just immediately as it happens to us. And most of the time we do that, we're caught up in it. But we do get these reflective moments when we think, well, what actually is going on here? And again, I've, you know, I'm, I'm, we're both older. Uh, um, and um, when you're younger, you have that forward drive of just growth and growing and your, your own progress. So that, that gives everything else around you a particular story and narrative, you know, but then, um, I guess after you hit the second part of life, or Jung talks about that, too, you know, where you, you've achieved all those goals. Um, so you don't just have that force of life itself driving you. You you start to ask if you're a reflective individual, like, okay, well, what what now, as it were? And that's traditionally when you're supposed to, or you have the time or the inclination to uh, look inward in some way. 
I think my, uh, my sorry, go on. Oh, no, 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 I was going to say, so that, that that's where, even though I've been writing about this for, for years now and all that, I, I, I find it more, more immediately pressing on me to my, my own, my own condition, my own, no longer, oh, this is a philosophy of life, or this is what this person thought or that person thought, and how does that all come together? It's like, ah, oh, well, actually here, I'm, I'm in the position now where I act, I, I do have to uh, somehow make real that 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 notion of you know you're you're um because you're no longer being pushed just by just by sheer life itself um and growing and all that you are faced with those sort of existential questions i mean the very ones i started out with ages ago when i first got interested in this sort of thing but they they come back now with with somehow a greater concreteness i would say perhaps death is that because you know i, I guess death. that's it you know yeah yeah the, the the end of whatever the narrative is that's that's usually the end of it at least yeah the, but this, it seems to be a of, general agreement that... yeah yes this phase we know <laughs> although if the trans if the transhumanists are or onto something maybe you know maybe that might not maybe be. but probably probably not in time for us i'm guessing yeah i would think yeah we're not uh most likely i'm not going to visit another planet you know uh physically you know, during my lifetime. So I could, I, I, you know, unsurprisingly, I suspect I resonate with what you said. I mean, I, there's a foundation in just how mysterious it is for me, which is being so deep now, it never goes. And, and also that need to, or desire, maybe more than need actually, to look for the best narrative, the best story, mm, the best mm, understanding. Mm. And like you, I mean, the bit that you said at the end there really got me because it is interesting. I think when when people when I talk to people about philosophy, sometimes I can see they think it's abstract, and it just feels like it's not abstract at all. It's about <laughs> this and and yeah. death and suffering and relationships and everything you do. And and I have this sense that I'm always living in sub, a sort of narrative, e even when I'm just doing my day to day things, which obviously is most of the time. Mm. there's a kind of narrow narrative which i and it's unquestioned i just do it and and then those moments you said of reflection which i'm very lucky i get plenty of those moments is when i can step back and go that's it's a bit like looking up in the night sky isn't it you know you you mm. live on this level looking at all the buildings and then you go whoa that's infinite uh, okay that's 100 billion galaxies uh and then back to the this is my bedroom and uh, that's 100 mm. billion galaxies that movement and trying to uh to, to that's where those questions become real and and mm. you the bit that you said that i wanted to get you to so you said about i need to make it real or something like that there was something something about well i mean um uh, i should say that the uh not not to, to said that to give emphasis uh to this feeling i have that they're 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 as I say, it's not as if it's always been abstract, but um, through a variety of different things in my own life, um, different changes in you know relationships ending, then COVID hitting, and then a variety of other things, there was a lot of movement and 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 sort of um, stress and so on and so on, and then all that kind of my own life sort of dissipated. It, it changed. It was no longer there, and I found myself ah. And out, and out of that, I arrive at the six. I turned sixty-seven, uh, you know, at the end of the last year, and sort of, you know, that hit me. Um, and then my life changing in 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 in, in, a, in a very radical way. Because basically, many things that I was dealing with were no longer there. Um, and so I found myself less of a problem of how do I deal with all this stuff. It's like, oh, what do I do now? Right. Kind of thing. Because then. A lot of the things I was talking about were also uh, involved in this sense of sort of forward movement I was having, and a career about career too, writing another book and trying to get ideas across and things of that sort. And then I guess after all those things, uh, it did seem like one day waking up and saying, "Oh God, I, I don't have to do all this stuff. I don't feel pressing. So what do I do now?" And it was a kind of not so much reinventing, but well. Colin Wilson, who's a writer who is um, very influential in my own work, um, in one of his early books, he he talks about um, 
the problem of freedom, and he calls the, par the paradoxical nature of freedom, uh, is, is when it's threatened, uh, we know exactly what it is and, and why we want it and why it's important, and we'll do everything we can to get it back and all that. But then once we have it, invariably, against our best wishes, we, we slip into this taking it for granted yeah. state of mind, and it becomes a burden in a way. You know, I mean, time is either something you don't have enough of or you have to kill. It rarely <laughs> is something that you know, it's either feast, it's feast or famine uh, in a certain way. But you do hit those some, those moments, those reflective moments, looking up at the sky or whatever, a puddle, raindrop hitting it, where it, it evens out and you're in the moment, as they say, and all that. And but then you that's when you do have a sense of freedom in the sense of in the sense freedom in the sense of being really alive, you know, feeling the reality of your life right right then and there, rather than being caught up in all the things that keep you going. Um, and another thing Wilson talks about is he says the problem is what we have to face is that we're very good when we have challenges. When we have something to face, we 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 pull ourselves together, we're we're, we're we can be immensely resourceful and purposive and full of vitality. But the real challenge is the challenge of no challenge. When we don't have an immediate sort of crisis or challenge or something facing us, when we have to somehow generate the same sense of purpose um, and focus that we, it happens when we have the, the crisis, it, it, it sort of snaps us into that. We have to somehow consciously in some way uh, use the imagination in order to do that in some way. Not necessarily create fantasize a crisis but bring <laughs> draw that draw on uh, draw on well no he would say like some, yeah, some yeah, of yeah. us psychologically we do it ourselves i mean I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. i i i suspect i'm probably prone to that in some way okay i somehow generate it and i liked okay okay i got the message let me figure out a way to do that without generating the crisis anymore yeah but it's being able to draw on the reserves that the crisis uh, you know uh compels you to awaken without actually having that. So with this, so this is the thing. So I, I'm finding myself now, and, and this is the existential, again, this is another cliche we hear all the time, existential crisis. I just, like, I just want to help the newscasters when they say that. You know, there's, uh, you know, uh, yes, where he, he was faced with a uh, massively iconic, perfect storm of existential crises. You know, it's, 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 this is another thing. But it's just, it is an existential crisis. It's what Tolstoy wrote about in The Death of Ivan. Uh, uh, the, the last uh, one of his last stories, uh, Ivan Illich, where this very successful landowner in Russia just wakes up one morning or one middle of the night and realizes he doesn't have any idea what his life's been about. Yeah, and buying another plot of land isn't going to do it anymore. So, so uh, uh, when you were talking about um, Colin, I had the I, hmm. I met him, I had tea with him once, and. Um, what uh, the book he, the book the book of his I think that really made a big impact on me probably not altogether positively was the outsider when I was very young, and um, probably encouraged me to live on the outside more than I probably might have been good for me. But the what was what I remembered and it was it seemed resonant with what you were saying was him talking about deliberately trying to enter peak experiences. Mm. And how he would sit and, and how irritated he got with his wife, I think it was, who would come in with tea and he'd go, no, I'm just about to get into a big experience. <laughs> and he was focusing and, and, and it was very funny and very endearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you have that with your, I'm just, I'm wondering in, I really got what you're saying. And I'm, I'm wondering with all of the, your background in esoteric spirituality and all of that, does that impact into all of that for you? Do you? Do you find yourself like you know, looking to change your state and to like? Oh yeah, well, uh, uh, yes, 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 and yes, and you know, uh, I, well, throughout the years, I've followed different practices or disciplines. Some, some more, you know, um, rigorously than others, and all that. And uh, but in uh, yeah, in general, um, I guess it it is a kind of. Should I say it? Using the imagination in in order to rather than induce a crisis, or is oh you know uh, uh, you know you uh, the, Wilson talks about Graham Greene you know being this bored teenager, and um, he was reading about Russian soldiers playing Russian roulette, and he discovers that his brother has a revolver in, in, in the cupboard, and he takes the revolver, puts one bullet in it, spins the chamber, goes out to Berkhamsted Common, and plays Russian roulette. 
So he was so bored to tears and so depressed that you know the, the idea of blowing his brains out was was you know uh, feeling a kick. And then when he hit the empty chamber, um, he suddenly a whole sense of depression and and meaninglessness vanished, and the world was just over overflowing with this terrific sense of possibilities and potentials. So uh, what Wilson says is like that. That's that that made you know putting a gun to his head made Green Green do this. Uh, and it's that act that somehow that focus, that concentration, that can he figured out there's different people as well, like Sartre. Sartre said he never felt as free as when he was in danger of being arrested by the Gestapo, you know, during the resistance and something like that. So you would think it's the exact opposite. But yeah. Oh, no, yeah. so it's that sense you puts you in a heightened and it's the same sort of thing I say as most spiritual dis disciplines want to do in some way. And and to, it's to focus, to focus the mind, you know, make yeah. the mind straight. Yeah, uh, like the Fletcher makes his blade, you know. So and so, so in some way to 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 bring that to bear in times that I'm feeling like I'm I'm drunk in boredom or I'm I'm um, feeling a kind of mild kind of you know world rejection or something like that. Uh, it's to sort of uh, in a way snap myself out of it and 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 but it's more of a focus of remembering. It's remembering this. It's re it's remembering. Ah, oh, okay. If you believe in what you've been writing about all these years and what you've been reading all these years, this is what's happening. This picture that you you have of things being, you know, whatever it might be, depressing and boring or something, um, that's more a reflection of your own mental state than 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 anything else. Um, so it's it's kind of having moments like that or focusing. And when I can get away from, you know, and I should talk, I've got a lot of freedom, but I I, I keep active, I keep busy, you know. If, you know, the life of the freelance writer is not, you know, sitting around with a Panama hat and, and you know, drinking a gin and tonic. You have to keep working all the time. So, but when I do have those moments, remembering in those moments to sort of even put more, more into it. So it's a kind of remembering of putting more of myself into what, you know, what I'm doing at the time, um, uh, rather than trying, going about it robotically let's say as we usually do and then letting kind of negative emotions take fill the vacuum yeah yeah so how does that I, i'm a bit I, I want i feel to ask you this i don't want to derail us from where we were but mm. I'll, I'll do it um i'm very intrigued by your i think it's still your latest book isn't it on the nature of precognition pre and mm. dreaming which is not something i've had my wife has it i don't have it oh, um, right. Um, and so how does all that fit for you when you're, it's like, if you're in, in your looking at life and time and what, what, what where have you ended well, up? Well, that's the other thing I have to, I have to remember that. I think, you know, you have to remember, like you've, you've, you've had all these experiences. So, I mean, but I, I think the thing is like, what, 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 I don't know about you. I think, you know, invariably I, I tend to drift into a kind of, uh, and still dealing with things and you're saying what is this and it's like what is this like what is life in the first place it's like what how could this how could we possibly exist here and not have the slightest idea why we do or why anything does you know what, how could that be the case and then the way things are particularly right now <laughs> it's a bit um dicey and and so on and so on uh but then i have to remind myself like okay that's true but you've had these dreams of the future and you know for a fact that that's the case um, unless you've been completely deluded so i have to again it's remembering i know intellectually that the kind of materialist you know view of the world and and the the, the strict you know see, see, temporal sequential of you know past present future and all that is very handy very helpful i wouldn't we, we can't do without it but it's not the only one so i have to sort of remind myself of the of the, the miraculous as it were and you're talking about that book, yeah. That's that that I would constitute as that as another practice. I, I, uh, I have the great luxury of being able to linger in the morning. Um, if I wake up very early, I'll I'll try to sink back into a half dream state, and I'll try to be aware of you know what's happening, what's coming up, and all and all that. And uh, and I, I copy my dreams down. And I've been writing my dreams down off and on for more than forty years now. And certainly since I. Uh, wrote the book during the first lockdown here um i've been writing them down all the time um so that's another sort of practice you know um and trying to 
I mean, forget about deciphering the dreams themselves. I think individually, we're usually the worst person possible to understand what our dreams are because they're what we're not conscious of. You know, we're you know we're this this is what we don't know. So, so you, you don't decipher your own dreams, or you do? Well, I I I, I I'm saying I I it's, it's not. That, I try not to do it as soon as it happens, unless it's something that's just slapped you in the face and it's like unavoidable, right. you know, because some dreams are like that. You know, some are very much, they're very, very straightforward. You can be too clever sometimes, like archetype hunting or something like that. Sometimes it's just, it's just very simple. Don't do that message. Yeah. <laughs> um, but other times they're, they're not quite like that. So what I do is over time, I write them down and then I'll, I'll read them back. Right. I've, I've I recently did that, read back the last couple months, you know, worth, worth the dreams. Um, but it's also just, you know, just link, being able to linger in that in-between state, the yeah. hypnagogic for a while. And uh, it's, it's, it is quite strange because it is, it's, it's almost as if you, you, you can go off in different currents in it. But that's the, how I've been feeling it lately. Cause I, 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 I try to sink back into some state where I could get picked up, something chew up and takes you along. I love that. Yes, that, that that's how I feel. It's kind of like yeah, waiting, yeah, 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 and then yeah. ooh, the current grabs you, and then you can go. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And, and it, there's a, it's a remarkable sense of, of freedom and relaxation, and but also it's a completely different flavor. It's a different taste of consciousness in that way. Yeah, yeah. And then you know, staying with that as long as I can, and then so so that's another sort of practice I do. But I mean, that's I have to remind myself because the dreams are real. There is real experience as as any other experience you have you know you yeah. have to, you're phenomenologically like that and there's a wonderful quote by jb Priestley, who i write about in, in um my book it's dreaming ahead of time it's the name of the book and peace Priestley coined this phrase the time haunted man uh he was a time haunted man and so it was jw dunn who wrote experiment with time it's one of the that, oh, early books was, about yeah yeah future yeah, dreams classic. and yeah yeah uspensky and and some others yeah yeah um but he says you know um the most, the most powerful experience he's ever had in, in, in his life came in a dream. And he said he has less ev evidence for it than he does for, you know, a broken nail or a, or a, a, a cough or something. So it, it's like, un, un, unless there is some universal observer who has, who's, who is privy to our dreams, you know, and unless you've had that strange experience of shared dreaming, which I, I have had in the past. Yep. Um, the dreams are very much yours, you know, yeah. and, you know, so there, it, it's it, that that itself is a very strange thing. It's like, oh, no one else in the world will ever know. Mm. If I never tell anyone this, no one ever, ever. So it's just a weird kind of thing to to realize that that, that, yeah, that, true, that, that, that is the case. All the it's time, true. isn't it? True with every yeah, thought that's you true. have. That's true. Yes. Every yeah, image you is, have. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. These are. Yeah. So how does that, how do you do? So when you, um, when you talk about having dreams of the future um which i'm you know i'm, I'm open to that but what uh, but i'm mm. i'm uh i reckon re I, I recoil in the face of any form of determinism or or predeterminism and i wondered how you mm. uh, well that's a good question i mean so well 99% of precognitive dreams are about rather trivial, insignificant things, we might say. Although, of course, with the caveat of saying, well, nothing's insignificant in a dream and nothing's trivial in a dream. I, I understand that. But if you just take them at face value, the ones we hear about are the two Ds, I say. It's a, uh, uh, disaster dreams, like the Aberfan, you know, um, horror in, in the 60s with the, the cold slip and all of that, and people dreamt of it beforehand in this, you know, newspapers and psychologists, you know, discovered this and all that. Or the somebody wins the Derby, you know, so that's the other D. So you hear about those. The ones you don't hear about are these ones that are about usually nothing in particular, and they wouldn't stand out in any way unless they were cognitive. And this is the case. I mean, um, my own experience has been like that. And then when I was doing all the research and, you know, reading old books about it and different accounts of it, going back as far back as Catherine Crow, uh, his book, The Night Side of Nature in like the mid, you yeah. know, that was 19th century. Uh, she, right. she predates, she, oh, you know, her oh, Night Side of Nature, Catherine Crow, yeah. she predated um, Myers and Gurney and all right. uh, the, you know, Society for Psychical Research and, and all of that. And it's a fantastic book. And it's, 
she was reading a lot of the German, they called the German philosophers at the time, and these were the, the, sort of the the natur um, uh, philosophers who were writing about um, what we would call the occult or the paranormal or ghosts or apparitions and you know the premonitions and things of that sort. But even she, she remarked that most accounts uh, of these are usually about rather insignificant kind of events, um, and they tend to have. When they tend to happen to people, they tend to happen fairly frequently, which has been the case in my life. And it's always been, I never wake up thinking, oh my God, I have to, I have to call my friend and tell him not to take that flight. Right. Or I should put 50 quid on, you know, tea biscuit or whatever. It's I don't know until later that day or the next day, or sometimes in some cases it, it's it's a few years, um, that it's it's been a glimpse of the future. And um so uh, it's it sort of you don't know when it until later on. So it's as if it's a film, as we get into the predestination and all that. It's sort of our life's a film, and at, at certain points, some of the scenes ahead of the film jump, jump, jump the queue, and you get them in advance. Um, but again, Priestley, who uh, had a few of these dreams and and uh, wrote that wonderful book, Man in Time, in the early sixties. Uh, that was sort of like Jung's no, kind no. of man in a sim. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's no, one of these no, great no, it's no. one of these great books that came out sort of in the '60s into the early '70s that were not by academics but by learned you know all round uh, just writers who were in, in, interested in ideas and things of that sort. So it's a history of our relationship with time, right? Uh, going back to the early you know uh, water clocks and things of that that sort, but. He also talks about his own experiences with with time, and you know he wrote the, all these plays about uh, deja vu and re recurrence, time in the Conways, and, yeah. and inspector calls and things of that sort. Um, but he tells a story about uh, a woman who um, had a dream that she was camping uh, with some friends, and she had to wash something. So she took, uh, she had a baby with her as well. So she took the baby and what she needed to wash down to the stream. And when she got there, she realized she'd forgotten the soap. This is all in the dream. So uh, she put the baby down thinking it would be safe. She's only being gone, you know, two seconds. Uh, and she went to get the soap and she came back. The baby had rolled over and had fallen into the stream and drowned. Then I don't know what the time lag was, but subsequently she was camping. And she did have to wash something, and she did have the baby. And as she was going to go, she remembered the dream. So she took the soap with her. So the baby didn't fall into the river and all that. So you might say, well, it, it's not a precognitive dream then, but I, my criteria for a precognitive dream are less strict than a, a baby drowning to have to make it true. But she was able to change the future. Yeah. Because yeah. she had it. So, so, so it's, I would say yeah. it's not as if it's only yeah. one way or yeah. the other. And some futures, maybe we want them to happen. So, you know, you know what I mean? You know, maybe that, maybe, maybe us somehow, it's not, it's not a future event that we should somehow want to change. Maybe it's one that we want to happen too. So I, I think it, it, it's helpful if we get away from the either or kind of aspect of it. You know, either we have free will or it's predestined. There's some overlap. Uh, I that makes sense to me, and I, 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 I did, this might be too big to launch into. I'll have a go. I'll, I'll it may, I may not make much sense because, um, it, it, I, the, my last book was ten years ago now, um, uh, Soul Story, and ever since then I've been working on enlarging the philosophy that I started there, and it's turned out to be a much bigger job than I expected, and I'm still doing it. But if I say it incredibly quickly well i could tell you what I'll, t I'll pick up the thing that you started our conversation with which is going you know maybe it is a um simulation i don't i don't think it is a simulation um i don't really know what that means but i do think treating it like an, an a ai system or a, auto, an autodidactic ai system a self-learning ai system i think is quite a good metaphor the latest one we've got and pretty good without confusing the metaphor with reality, of course. And one of the things that I have been playing with is whether it's possible to articulate a, a different form of spirituality in, in a sense, which I think of as emergent, where reality is conceived of, you know, I'm experiencing this moment as this flow of change, 
in which the next moment builds on the past, the next moment builds on the past, and that whether that's possible to go, well, that's what this is, that process of becoming, and we currently think it's 14 billion years old, and it started with the simplest things you can imagine, and it's been becoming richer and richer and richer and richer and richer as more and more information has accumulated, as it were. So the past is accumulating and informing what happens in the present. And what I started, I've been playing with is whether the domain of the psyche or the soul that the that I've been exploring all my life um, is actually the most emergent level of that whole process. So once it's reached biology, the psyche will emerge, but not just as a byproduct of something, but as a whole domain in its own right, so that it's made of imaginal information, which is why whenever I go into it, it's all images taken from the sensory world, but they have a life of their own now. And there's a domain which I'm in right now, which this one it seems to be held together by physical causation, but this one is held together by meaning, narrative meaning. And that the domain that I step into in meditation or in, in, in um, taking ayahuasca or dreams or all of that stuff is that domain and like you said it's real this is very real and also collective and you can go beyond your own personal little bubble and experience these these wider things and my mm. hypothesis would be that's what that that's what death is that death is the mere is the continuation of that without this and mm. and but the 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 bit i particularly wanted to bring up here around the, the idea of dreaming and time is that when I think of it like that, what I tried to articulate was like with an AI system, if you had, well, like, like, like with a computer game, it's kind of a crass comparison, but it, if you said, well, look, there's a narrative, it's a, it, what starts as ones and zeros has ended up as a story, which mm. you interact with, you'd get that. And they're all real. Uh, but the story element is a fact is affecting what happening just as much as the as the other elements it's all interacting mm. and that therefore reality has actually become a story as it were it's emerged onto this level and the fact is that on the physical causal level i can predict the future all the time i'd be in real trouble if i couldn't i'm not always right but if i can't predict when i throw a ball where it's going to hit i'm not you know it's like there's and i i predicted that you'd be here at 11 30 and damn me mm. you were and <laughs> we're having this conversation you might not have but I predicted it and it happened and that there might be another level to that in which the same, there's a narrative causation to things that may be very deep in the nature of existence now, which we experience as synchronicity and the magic of life and all those things. Mm -hmm. And that what you're seeing in a, pre, in a precognitive dream is, Oh, you're, you're, you're given a perspective. Oh, that's where it's going. Now it doesn't mean it will, well, right now, that's where it's going uh, with the same narrative causality that you might if you went, oh, that ball's going to hit there. Uh, there you go. It did like that. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, no, it could very well. It could very well. I mean, um, I mean, Dunn, you know, who, who first, I mean, the the phenomena of precog precognition, precognitive dreams is, you know, classic. It goes goes far back. But Dunn, yeah. he's one to sort of popularize it in the 20s. And he talks about three, well, an infinite regress of different levels of time. Uh, which is one of the things that, for him, it was important uh, for him to announce this new philosophy that he called serialism, which in the end would, um, it explained that, you know, death is exactly some form of exactly what you said, it's just the next sort of level. And while we're here now in our sequential time, what he calls time one um, of our waking life, we're basically gathering information uh that is eventually transmitted up to a kind of universal observer at, at, at some point um and uh in time two during the dreaming time we're out of harness as it were we're in harness here i'm looking like the horse and we're going in one direction and so we're in harness but then in time two we're out of that and we can kind of look in the back behind us and see the past and the past comes through very vividly in dreams sometimes but also bits of the of the future and uh but it's all a bit mixed up so that's why, unless you had an experience of a precognitive dream, or unless, like myself, you read Dunn's book and you said, okay, I'll, I'll check this out, which is exactly what I did. This was ages ago. Right. And yeah, yeah. When I lived in, in New York, it was about 1980 or so. And I was 
right and so indiscriminately devouring everything about the occult and the paranormal and all the when you were a pop star <laughs> oh well yeah well you know sort of a satellite a pop satellite i, I tend to think of myself <laughs> as it's a round bunch of other stars uh but um i said he just said you know do what i did write your dreams down and you'll see that you bits of the fuse should turn up and it lo and behold that's that's exactly what happened so yeah. but I paid attention to the dreams and that's why I noticed it. So, but if you don't do that more times than not, you won't. And you might get the funny feeling, oh, deja vu sort of feeling. Yeah. But I have to say myself, I still get deja vu, but it's it's not the same feeling as when I know, oh, I've dreamt this. It's, yeah. it's a, there's a precognitive tingle that is different than the, 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 because the deja vu, it's like, did I, or didn't I, or was this, or was that? Because there's, there's a, there's the an precog, end. it's like, bang, I know it's, it's make, but uh, yes, this I, I dreamt this. I, and there's I a I there's a feel, feeling anyway, isn't there? Don't you do you have that of of regardless of the dream element? I'm just thinking as you're speaking. There's times when I ju you I just have a very strong intuition. Oh, it's going this way. Oh yeah, sure. And and that's but that's significant, isn't it? That you have that. Mm. It's not like you're not sitting there thinking oh, it could go anyway. You just you can and those mm, those mm, mm. and those even down to the days when you just think oh everything's going my way today, and yeah, yeah. and it does. Or the algorithms, I guess, are. And it, one of the things which got work, me yeah. late in my life, um, having been a, a kind of intellectual snob, I guess, as, as a, or as an outsider at least, and putting down sport and not having any time for it. Um, later in my life, I, I deliberately seek out things that I've rejected. So I got, I started watching football, oh. and really took to it. And um, one of the things which has really struck me with that is how that element of synchronicity and magic and the the collective experience shows up mm. all the time mm. and in in quite bizarre ways and you can see that 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 uh that especially when you see a player who is not only in the zone because they they happen to be performing very well that day but they're just lucky <laughs> just you know, the ball just arrives at their feet and they just knock it in you know it's like they can yeah. do no wrong it's yeah. more than just they're having a skillful day and they're well calibrated today it's like there's the whole something happening they're they're yeah. the narrative is working their way yeah no i mean that's uh, when i was a musician there were times like that yeah i mean I, 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 i've never been a sports person myself although when i was a kid i played basketball but but uh but i, I mean I know what you're saying when I've watched uh, my sons when uh, they're grown now, but when they used to stay with me, they would, they would watch the footy and I'd sit and watch it with them. And then I, I would see it as a pattern. There was like patterns going, yeah. you know, across the yeah. field and that, that sort of thing. And um, it's a kind of dance and you can see that not, you know, sometimes even just if, if you're at one of these reflective moods sitting in like a square somewhere and people milling about, you can start to see, sort of patterns kind of emerging or you know it, it's subjective you know perhaps you're projecting on there but still there does seem to be something that it doesn't seem to be quite as arbitrary uh and 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 just contingent but i know and when that, i was a musician used to get into these 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 period you know when you're just kind of playing around and then bang everything just works you know yeah and yeah. it's just one after the other and then there's a great interchange between yourself and the audience and i get something like that when i give talks now it's not yeah. quite the same thing but you get into a good rapport with the audience and and um it becomes more of a kind of performance rather than just like a talk and a lecture and you could really see in the, all those experiences or it, or it seems to me the way in which the psyche the soul is not just the little bubble which seems to be the popular mm. view at the moment around the head but actually mm. is a whole ecosystem of psyche it's a place where you can meet and connect and form and and me, i i was I was a musician when I was young and yeah. not as successful as you were, but the, um, I did all sorts. Um, but the experience there was the thing that drew me in was this, again, that same thing, that way in which with other musicians, you would form something more than the individual, mm. which mm. happens also when you run an event. I'm, I do retreats where I actually deliberately bring about that condition in people and mm. It's it's absolutely magical, actually. Mm, I think there's yeah. there's more that happens in those states than probably any other for me. Mm, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's when you sort of, um, I guess it's lessening the ego boundaries. Uh, 
technically in some way, you know, you you sort of feel a group, not necessarily a group consciousness, but there is a kind of a rapport or more, but it, uh, even in another way, it, 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 uh, you can feel it just viscerally and it's not yeah. quite the same thing, but one one thing I, 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 I've talked about in a couple of places in my books is um, many years ago when there was the, the anti uh, uh, war march here. I think it was two thousand three, something like that. Or, yeah. or uh, don't don't start the war march because it hadn't yet, you start, started yet. Um, and I went on it, and yeah. um, with my, my sons and their mom and other other, other folks, and um, we're somewhere in Shaftesbury Avenue or something like that. And I saw behind me that you know the wave. People were doing the wave sort of thing, you know. And I said, okay, when it comes up here, I'm I'm going to resist it. I'm 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 not going to do it. And this this thing, whatever for whatever reason, I thought that. But then I could feel it actually approaching, you know. And I could feel it in my body. This kind of a wave, a sort of a current go through. And I actually felt like I had to keep my arms down from doing it. So there was some kind of visceral, visceral sort of flow. Uh, uh, among the group like that. And again, you know, we're usually in our conscious minds, like you said, this little light bulb uh, on in there. And that's um, where you are most of the times. And we're not aware of these other sorts of, you know, things that are around us all the time. Yeah, uh, not, not not always a positive thing, I guess, though, as well. I, it's like, a, I can see it. You know, it can also be a what makes a mob or a, a crowd. Well, exactly. Well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's the same. It's the same. sort. Uh, well, this, this, um, German Swiss philosopher Jean Gebser, um, who uh, he died in the early 70s, 73, but he wrote this remarkable book called The Ever Ever Present Origin, yeah, uh, which is one of these great doorstopper works of um, sort of philosophy and 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 um, history and uh, interdisciplinary uh, work in the 20th century. But he talks about different structures of consciousness that have emerged over time. Uh, from what he calls the origin, it goes ever present. It's 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 always there. It's one of these things we, we we can find in different traditions, like the sunyata or the pleroma or things of that sort. But it's difficult to talk about it in any kind of straightforward way. But he does talk. He says that these different levels: um, archaic, the magical, the mythic, the mental. Um, we're currently in the the mental, and have been for the last several centuries. But it's, we're, we're experiencing the breakdown. Of the mental rational structure of consciousness, and uh, the, you, you might think there's plenty of evidence for that uh, uh, around these days. But he says the other structures they don't disappear; they're still they're still there. They're still part of our sort of being or experience, but we're 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 not in them as much as we are on the others. And that magical structure he he, re, he relates to sort of the body and 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 the, the viscera and 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 a kind of um, corporal un unconscious or physical unconscious and that and the sort of thing that we were just talking about that kind of group mind he was a young man he experienced the early nazi rallies in yeah uh in munich and had to and, and had to escape you know uh, from that and uh but that that's another experience of yes and and it's a ter ter terrific terrific exhilarating feeling too yeah you know, you to be part of that huge crowd it feels real it is yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly it's, powerful feeling and, and you can yeah. see the same thing in you know I, i'm not as you probably guessed attracted to fundamentalist religion but i you know you look at a fundamentalist church and you can just see people are in that hmm, so it's hmm. not it's a yeah. kind of it just feels like look this is a natural phenomena yeah. a bit like a I mean, bit like that ability to the magic, you know, in the yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would, I would say throughout history, there's, there's, there's a dialectic or a conflict between these two, those two things. You know, there's this. We have that is a tremendously powerful feeling to to become part of this larger being than yourself, and it's incredibly attractive, and and we need it. it it's a vital part of our life. But at the same time, that um, we are individuals. You know, yeah. we we we, we have you know we have uh, agency. Um, yeah. And uh, the intellect can suffer, you know, from being absorbed in that larger kind of thing. And I think there's a play off between those those two sorts of things. I mean, Arthur Kessler ages ago talked about the whole on, you know, then it's it's part, um, you know, to something bigger than itself, it's a part than something, you know, under it, it's it's a whole. And and we and we tend to have both of those those sides of it: the self transcendent and the self assertive. And the, I think you can, you can see, you know, a kind of struggle between those those two things, I think, throughout throughout uh, our history. 
Yeah, and, and, and a kind of the waking up from the crowd, the fact that we've had to individualise from something collective. And when I look back in history, I'm always shocked by, by, by and large, how collective it seems and how the whole, the idea of a ideational individual and an individual has their own ideas is so, that you know, the history is obviously they full mm. of people like that, but we mm. remember them because they're so isolated and, mm. and that's become more and more and more and more and more, hence culture has exploded. And, yeah. and so there's that kind of waking up from some unconscious collectiveness. And then there's the waking up further into some conscious unity and they mm. feel like opposite sides of something. Mm. And one of the things which I'm, I, because I've got kind of pulled into or not pulled into, but I was kind of seen as part of the, um, non-dual thing that, that really took off 20 mm. years ago or 25 years ago. I was speaking at a lot of events there and, and wanting to co constantly emphasize the individual as the foundation from it. And I think that's partly because of my foundation in more Western esoteric ideas mm. rather than the Eastern idea, which is the eradication, not always, but often the eradication of the individual, seeing through the, the illusion of separateness, all of that, rather than uh, the idea, especially in this new evolutionary picture, which I'm interested in, where the individual, the, the, the ability to self-reflect and to notice like you, oh, the, the wave's coming and I could yeah. or couldn't go with it, you know, that there's mm -hmm. even that possibility, means that then when you come into a state of unity, your, well, the word I'm playing with at the moment for my next piece of work is a univigil, an individual conscious <laughs> of unity. Mm. rather than the dissolution of the individual it's like another level of that evolution where yeah. you've realized oh look the universe is a one and i am it but i'm mm. at it as tim meeting it as gary and that's really significant that's not mm. a problem or an illusion well i i think it also may be the case that as you were saying it's an ongoing process uh, rather than there's oh uh becoming ego less i, I blend with the all and it doesn't seem to be much more you could do uh, after that. Whereas I, if if it's an ongoing process, um, yeah. you, you maintain your individual mind, uh, the ability to make choices and to understand. I, mean, I think that's the difference in the mystic and the esoteric. The mystic is is pretty much wants to go straight straight on, wants to go from Malkuth to Kether, right? You know, or or at least Tifereth, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And not necessarily want to linger yeah. in the other spheres and get yeah. to know them whereas the esotericist tends to want to understand wants to know wants to you know uh not necessarily blend and 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 um lose the ego i mean a gapster makes a distinction between being ego free and ego less so you can be ego okay. free that means you don't have it doesn't mean you don't have an ego but you're not constrained by it or you're not limited to it and it's an ego it's an eye that's aware of other and yeah. alterity and all, yeah. all these you know abstractions that we can go on from that and, and those sort of sense rather than blending in and in, into the all in some ways um but i i mean i'm you know i'm 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 an evolutionist or creative evolutionist um you know the sort of bergson shaw wilson uh teha de Chardin, you know uh yeah. whitehead that's you know there's um although that's one side and the, the sort of esoteric side in a certain sense where rather than as consciousness being somehow emergent out of uh, whatever the world as it is, uh, as we find it, maybe in the as the esoteric traditions talk about it, it, it comes from some other dimension and has entered into this realm uh, for some purposes of it. And you know, so you know, I mean, um, Vasky, she was asked, you know, why, 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 if the higher realms are you know much more free. Um, and not constrained by matter. Why? Why do we find ourselves here? And she said, "Well, basically, this is the realm in which we can we can accomplish something. This you you, you can't sculpt with the cloud that that way. So, so you need so, some kind of so, solid, solid 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 spirit needs some kind of resistance to get the best out of it. And again, this goes back to this notion that we when we're challenged, when we have challenges, we get the best out of ourselves. So so the big change for me, Gary, I would say. There's been a, quite a few actually as I've got older. Um, I'm a little tiny bit younger than you. I'm 60, I've just been 64. And the um the the one of the big changes which happened uh, I guess, well, probably 15 years ago now, it still feels recent, and it's been building since, is was the rejection of all of that 
that version and and really just which i which was in a lot of my books i had to sit down Mm. and go i think this is all wrong and eventually becoming much more involved in that that evolutionist current and going Mm. Mm. that if there if the, the the possibility of one simple narrative of one thing uh, of forming of this forms from this this forms from this and then feeling like the, like i said like the, the, the when we were discussing time that rather than this common idea that the time has kind of past is just gone it, it, of going no it hasn't gone anywhere the past is right here it's forming this this is being formed by the past mm. and everything that has formed is formed and that would include me so suddenly there's a theory of identity, which I find it really attractive in its simplicity, which is, oh, I'm meeting everything Gary's ever been. Gary's a relationship between this person and the universe, and I'm meeting everything that that relationship has ever ha- has happened in that relationship. Mm. And, and you're meeting everything that's happened in this relationship, which means, well, funnily enough, I was looking at uh, the Keats line this morning, because something someone else had sent me, about this being a veil of soul making. Mm. and that resonated my book soul story was going to be called soul formation um, but the publishers changed it for whatever reason uh, but the the idea being look what we're doing here every second is forming ourselves mm. we've we, we and and the, the fact that i am reflective and therefore have some degree of choice means that i'm the bit of the universe that can actually reflectively form myself Whereas up until relatively recently, that wasn't possible. And suddenly it feels like, wow, this is... And then all of those spiritual realms that I've been exploring in my life, as I said, become the, the most emergent level of this process, hmm. which is why they're so special, which is why when you go into them, you just feel like, wow, this is really real. Um, rather than, you know, it's an illusion or it just like, it has a quality to it, in my experience, which is so real. And of course, it's all real, but it's the most emergent level hmm. of that unfolding mm. of realization mm. well i mean i i believe that you know we actually with with human consciousness uh is a totally different dimension reality has has come into it as well yeah um and again it sounds you know we're the cutting edge i would say you know yeah. i mean we may individually be dull blades but we yeah. are we are we are the cutting edge uh because we're 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 that that point where things are extending into the not yet i would say even though with precognition there is some sense of you know this looks like it's going to be happening in that but um you know no i i i, I think that's why i i am it's not as if oh you know one is right and the other is wrong the evolutionist picture or the or the um esoteric sort of picture and there's not necessarily one picture out, out of all those all those things too um but uh i mean but even bergson you know bergson talks about life being some kind of um force that's different than matter and it's it's entered into matter and it's through that that you have you know the different forms of life and so on and then his you know his last book uh, two sources of morality and religion. He talks about the universe as a machine for for making gods, in some ways. So yes, there is that that sort of um, trajectory. And again, you know, uh, the whole idea that at death it's some end. You know, you you go to heaven or hell, whatever it is, or uh, off. You know, it's it's you're, you're blown away. There's nothing anymore. But perhaps the same sort of struggle goes on um, there, uh, wherever there may be. Uh, that that we find ourselves engaged in in here. That would be uh, because, my sense completely. Yeah, because I I I you know, it's that sense of an ongoing process, something happening. Yeah. Maybe it. I mean, people talk about the mysteries of the universe and the black holes, and I think you know, forget them. The, the most mysterious things in the universe is ourselves. Yeah, we are the strangest possible thing in so far that we know about in any way whatsoever and that's why we have these questions of like why you know why do we exist and what are we supposed to do now that we're here and if you started out earlier uh the very cheerful note you know what's what is it all about you know yeah. as far as we know i'm not i'm not excluding the possibility of other beings out there in some way or perhaps a tree does question its own existence but i i, I somehow don't, don't think so because we tend to 
think of nature as being something that that is is at one with itself and it's not it, it isn't you know it doesn't face the human problems we have of of all these unanswered questions about well, why do we exist and all that um but i i you know I, I think you have to start with those sorts of questions it's why i really like the idea that that um when i've looked i've done a lot with death over my life um both personally and kind of professionally in writing and stuff and one of the things which where i've arrived at now let me put it like that has, has been that simplicity of oh i'm all you know the psyche obviously you know this but you know the greek word just means soul that's a germanic word for the same thing it seems to be talking about this thing i'm experiencing now it's an imaginal realm and you can go off in it and if you if you stay with your attention in this that seems like a in the background it's just imagining talking mostly and then um if you uh go into it and it can really take off can't it like in dreams but also you can do it while awake mm. and or like i said on psychedelics or any of that so the idea now for me of look i'm already in that there's nowhere i'm going to go mm. that's just going to open up like it does anyway from time to time and because i won't have any biological biological aspect to me then i won't be able to see things here and i won't be able to hear things that will just go but what if that psyche or the soul merely continues and like like now if i give it my attention it becomes vivid and if i don't give it my attention it's not vivid so if i if, if it's the only thing that's got my attention well then it'll be more like those experiences where you go in and the dream is so vivid or you like you said you have a collective dream or and i look at their near-death experiences and that's what they look like and i look at i wrote a book on the history of people's visions of heaven and i started looking at that and, and when i worked on it years ago it was like very much oh these are things that people have imagined and believed and da, 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 reflections of their culture and, and maybe there's truth to that but the idea that that might actually be a description of an evolving realm which starts as shady and not very formed and then becomes like this life but either uh, wish fulfilling or horrible or but some reflection of it and then becomes really religious and full of as as human beings psyches develop and now we're getting the near-death experiences and we get these multicultural vivid beautiful experiences uh with with co common threads but also very individual reflecting their a particular psyche and suddenly i was like well look that, that 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 can make sense of this experience and doesn't divorce us from this other realm like it's somewhere else it's like you no know, it's where it's where the it's where the one process has got us to and we're in it like you said that's why we're the leading edge isn't it because we're in that mm. that's mm. where this whole conversation apart from me who has to throw his hands around for some reason we our bodies have just sort of sat here quite happily and we've spent our whole time in that realm well that's i've trained I'm myself not to move my hands because i tend to hit the microphone <laughs> oh well done i'm terrible mine just fly everywhere no, I, I tend to be more like that myself, yeah. but no, I'm I'm always uh, well curious about the different reports of uh, well, there's near death experiences. I, I gave a talk recently about Jung and his uh, relationship with the dead, and um, mm. I started out with his own near death experience he had um, mm. about 1944 uh, when he had slipped and um, broken his leg, and then while he was in the hospital, he had uh, had a heart attack. And, um, you know, he, he it's very much along the lines of, you know, what um, what 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 we hear about them now. But then also, you know, um, his previous experiences, strange experiences when um, after his breakup with Freud, um, all the visions he had and waking dreams and, and um, all of that, that uh, he recorded in the Red Book. And uh, so he's talking about. And he, he uses a phrase that I, I tend to think is is um, more helpful than collective unconscious. So he doesn't use it as often. He calls it the objective psyche. I love that. And, and the sense that basically there are things in the mind that have nothing to do with you personally. Yeah, I love that. You, you, you just happen to be, you know, you, 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 we are the outskirts. Individually, we're sort of the outskirts of this inner realm. And it's kind of like this is the, the you know, we, we live at the end of the street. And uh, we tend to only spend a little bit of time on that on that little you know area, that patch uh, of town. But if we can train ourselves to sort of turn around and go inward, we discover, oh my God, 
this leads into a place where yes there's all these memories of my life and all that but there's all this stuff that doesn't have anything to do with me personally but it, it it's, I mean it's we a, look at an we, objective realm in its own way and so how and so Steiner then Steiner reads the Akashic record or Swedenborg yeah. gets taken to heaven and hell by the angels uh, and so on and there's different visionaries of different sorts of things and they all seem to be different and this is why you know skeptics can say well it's all subjective but I tend to think of it as like well remember you know, if we go back to the early explorers of the new world you know some of them landed in Nova Scotia and some of them landed in the Bahamas right it's the new world but it's very very di different places you know the terrain is very different the inhabitants are different and all that sort of thing so could very well be in some way even though the reports differ between Steiner and Jung and Swedenborg they and as you're saying it's it's a mixture of sort of personal and a kind of impersonal um sort of yeah. realm you know? um, imaginal like this conversation yes, 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 this conversation yes, exactly, has an objective yeah, yeah. quality because we're yes, sharing it yes, but yes. it's still but you're speaking from your experience and I'm speaking and and yes. but yes. we're meeting I had funnily enough I had a I had I was recording a um exploring these ideas on death for um a presentation mm. and the image that came up for me was not dissimilar to the one you just mentioned mm. was imagining uh the middle ages and somehow people had made it to um Australia and managed to make it back to Europe going look there's another land on the other side of the world and people going don't be ridiculous that's impossible and as more and more people came back going no there is a land on the other side of the world mm. it's, well it can't be the world's flat and if you're on the other side you'd fall off and and until somebody goes oh maybe it's not flat and once you've made that change it's like oh there is a land on the other side of the world it's perfectly understandable and and that the same with things like the near experience whereas whereas my take on it is although we've have so many reports now it's dismissed because it's people on the other side of the world would fall off it's impossible yeah. and yeah. that's it yeah. rather than if you shift your ontology if you see it if you see if you see what it is in a different light then the fact that it's imaginal and that it will be colored by the person's unique experience their soul their objective experience and then the other thing which which occurred to me was was thinking about the evolution of life and how we take we look at life and it's formed an ecology and we get that it's an ecosystem but for individual life forms that were first developing they must have known very little about that because they had no <laughs> senses to speak of and it was going to take a long time before we could look around and go oh look there's a whole ecosystem that i'm part of and 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 it feels a bit like that with the psyche sometimes to me it's like we're still developing that faculty to go oh i'm part of a whole ecosystem and then when you think about the the experiences you are describing of the group connection or seeing the future all of that is when you suddenly go oh there's something objective that i'm in touch with here or intersubjective mm. at least mm. Mm. which mm. you can become better at connecting with well i think that's that's uh, exactly it you know um that's what we have we at, le at least that's a terrain we still have and it's still ours this interior world but the way things are going in many ways uh there may be ways where they can monetize that in the future in some way so I hope that's not the case but uh no we can still explore that that interior realm you know and it's the inner space um like I said earlier I'm 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 most likely never going to set foot on another planet but I can I can explore this this inner inner space that's there and uh it just takes in one sense it's very easy but it's difficult because we we're, we don't have the habit of doing it or perhaps you know you do or other people who have been interested in this stuff for, for many many years but just just to take the average person as you know, as you say we tend to have our consciousness focused on the outer world all the time we have to deal with things and um when we have those moments those so, sort of breathers um we may have a sudden feeling of oh I don't, I don't know I I suddenly feel a bit different than I feel most of the time or somehow that flower looks different than um isn't that beautiful or something like that and that that that's the time and if we had the knowledge and 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 the motivation to do it we would be able to go deeper and and, and explore so I get you people who pursue meditation do that but I I think these these moments open up to us all the time as it is already they're, they're part of like I said before we have we have the sort of uh there's the, the clenched fist which is the self-assertive and you know I'm going to maintain myself against all the forces around me that want, want to you know absorb me and then there's the ah yeah, where you open up and you feel 
oh, you're you're porous and you want you wanted to come to come in. And uh, we're, we're like that most of the time and different meditative you know practices and other sort of spiritual practices teach us how, how, how to do that without completely just sort of slipping into just you know falling asleep or or or, or it's it's maintaining an, an alertness at the same time you have that that open yeah. that yeah. openness. Uh, but I think those sort of moments come to us more often than than we think. We just yeah. most of us just aren't aware that that's what's happening when 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 they when they take place. Yeah, it's also why I think a really deep narrative of life is so important because when you have that and those moments happen, you're more likely to notice them mm. because you have a you have a story in which they make sense rather than oh what was that? Exactly, exactly, yeah. No, well, I think we all we all have to have some kind of story uh, going on, and um, um, that when 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 you don't have it, that's when it all becomes kind of flat and stale and unprofitable, and um, and and so on. And um, that's when you have a real existential crisis, you know, in the sense that you you your life has failed. Um, but um, I mean that. Just what we just that exchange is a sort of story. Okay, yes, uh, that kind of imagery, you know. So yeah. I, 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 I can tell myself, and I know. Oh, oh, just like the other day, I took the bike out. Uh, it was a lovely day, and I cycled through Regent's Park, and the flowers were out in bloom, and I hadn't seen them in a while, and I was just completely struck by the colors, and I just had to stop and look, and there was some patch. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not a botanist. I don't know the names of the flowers but there was some contrast between an incredibly bright pink and a very rich luscious yellow and i just found myself staring at it and i know for me and i i see those colors it's like christmas lights when i was a kid comes back yeah. or old comic books when i was a kid i mean i grew up in in the 60s and that's called the silver age at least in the states of comics and they have these fantastically bright covers and colors all the time and it's a Proustian experience, you know, for me. It's a, 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 when that color, and I can even taste it. It's 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 like it's a it's like it's a richness that is there all the time, but most of the time we don't, you know, we're not open and relaxed enough to to let it get in. Oh, well, Gary, I think, thank we covered, I think we covered a lot of ground, Tim. We have. It was very <laughs> nice to to do that with you. I think is yeah, what I yeah, want to say. Yeah. And the just ah yeah. oh, yes, hello. I was going to ask you that you said you you're, you're doing a spiritual retreat or yes uh, doing coming it up uh, this weekend yeah yeah so what what, what what's involved in that um so, i mean is it something you're you're running you're you're leading it yeah or it's yeah. Oh, right, right, yeah so i've been doing these deep awakening things for a long time all over the world and and i don't do them so much now because my focus is on on uh, uh developing the ideas but i still love to do them because it's that's what it's really about I mean, i'm 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 not really a philosopher i'm a love junkie that's the truth and uh so it's a process which uh is experiential and it leads people through various uh, activities that we can do together meditations and connections to what will happen on the second evening which yeah. is um a gazing circle um which i've been developing like i said for 20 years i suppose in which you you'll find yourself in front of somebody i, I create a beautiful environment because beauty does is magical and i play beautiful music because that's magical and i get everyone very relaxed into just being themselves without any spiritual you know all of that stuff just like just being themselves and then you say, hey, look, just look at this other person. And for some reason, I, I don't know why it is, I get such a cross section of people because of all the different types of things I've written, probably. So there's no type and, and it's really interesting and, or age. And it's like, oh, so you don't know who you're going to be sitting with. And then just go look for three minutes. Music will play and just look and you see someone's face and that's beautiful. And then realize that you're connecting actually with something you can't see which is mm. another soul and just sit with that. And then if you, if you, if you pay close attention, you may have this moment where suddenly there's one of you looking at itself and you just, mm. and then when you've done that with one person, you move around and there's another one. And then you do that. And then when you've done it with that person, you move around and there's another one. And from the initial, if people are new to it, sometimes they're a bit uncomfortable, but have you got them relaxed by the time we've been into it? But by the third or fourth person, you're just like, 
woof. Mm. It's like it, their love is you're walking, the, the love in the room is like thick. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, whoa, where did this come from? And and it's the the best way I found to take people from that, as you put it, to mm. this, mm. but together. And and so there's mm. such a profound sense of love and connection and, and unity and uh ecstasy, I would say, joy. Um and that's the that's it, it was having those experiences my, when I was young. My first one was when I was a kid, and mm. then retouching it and retouching it. That's why I've ended up doing all the things I've done. It's because of mm. that experience. And my biggest mm. aspiration has always been to share it with people. And I thought I'd never ever be able to do that. And then it, I just kind of found that I could. Oh wow! And now I do. <laughs> well, fantastic! Wow, that's fantastic! Wow, yeah. it's a real privilege. I'll, I'll I'll have to come on one one of these days. Please Sounds do. Good. Please do. I'll 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 send you some info. It'd be great. Yeah, let me know. All right, I will. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Well, uh, it's been great talking to you. This is. I just. My God, I haven't had a conversation like this. Certainly not at this time of day. <laughs> <laughs> not without like half a bottle of wine. So it's. Uh, no, it's fantastic. Uh, great. Thanks for inviting me. I, uh, I, it's it's really been a real pleasure it. to yeah. me. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, okay. let's um, let's keep in touch. Yeah. Let's. All do right. It. All right. All right. Take care. Goodbye. All right. Cheers. Bye bye now. Bye bye.